So today's clinic, I'm going to, um, it's going to be me and my trusty little computer. A lot of today's music, as you guys know, is cut on Pro Tools, Logic Pro. Right now I'm using Logic Pro, as you can see. Oops, sorry, Ben. Anyway, um, PowerBook. And a lot of the sessions I do, as a matter of fact, I have a session at 2 p.m. at Capital A right after this that's going to be using uh, Pro Tools, which I don't have on my PowerBook, but a lot of records today and jingles, movies, it's all cut on Pro Tools. So because we're all drummers and we have to know our technology as well as our drums, I highly suggest getting into computers as much as drumming because you'll find that they are hand in hand, unlike a drum machine because there's, there's just much more control inside of a computer that you can do as a drummer into the computer, into the computer as a drummer. So it, it works hand in hand. That's my theory. A lot of drummers would argue me with that, but that's just my approach with it. Because <laughs> I, doing what I do, playing on records and stuff, uh, you're always under scrutiny with a lot of microphones and computers, so you could be corrected or uncorrected, so better to, to join them than to try to beat them. So anyway, I'm going to be doing some tracks along with my computer here, and um, we're just going to have some fun, and then uh, maybe you know, do some questions and answers, and, and uh, I'm going to get uh, Garrison from Drum Workshop. He's here today. Let's have a hand for him. He's the artist uh, relations guy at Drum Workshop, and when you guys become rich and famous drummers, you will be talking to Garrison. I'm not rich, I'm not famous, but I talk to Garrison and he helps me out with some drums. So he's the guy to talk to and you'll, he'll explain all that later. But um, first I'm gonna do a little playing. This is a track I wrote last night before I, I went to bed because I had no idea what I was gonna do. And I did it all on my 12 inch power book and a little MIDI keyboard. And it goes a little something like this.
So check this out. Uh, having one of these just opens up your whole musical realm. You can write grooves such as this. So So you're no longer confined to a metronome, which I think, uh, back when I was going here, that's all we had to play to was metronomes that you would rent from the library, the Dr. Beats. And <laughs> I'd program that thing and clack, 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 and it would drive me nuts. And then finally I was able to save up enough money for a Alesis SR-16 drum machine. And I bought that and would bring it to my my rehearsal space and practice along with that. So that's where I developed a lot of my time and a lot of my groove so I could play in studios, you know, along with a click or other musicians in the band with a conductor. So it just helps, uh, it helps that aspect of drumming. I remember a long time ago when I was a student here 20 years ago, I went to a Jeff Beccaro clinic and he talked about when you play good time, you're able to pay your bills on time. And that always stuck with me. It's like, man, I don't want to be a drummer that's like in debt and unable to pay my bills. So that was always an incentive for me, you know, to be able to play some good time, make it feel good, and make sure the telephone is still on so I could get more calls so I could work. So hopefully, I'm still doing that. I think I am. You'll have to ask my wife. She'll tell you. Uh, so, I'm going to stop here. I want to just answer any questions about any of this thus far. Any questions for Kurt? Yeah, I any mean, questions? We could right. talk drums. You could come yeah. up and visit me. It's hard to get him. Yeah, He's running off to a session, so. You know, one of the things I regret when I was a student here 20 years ago was that I sat in the audience just like you guys and I never asked any questions. And I saw Harvey Mason, John Robinson, um, Paul Cook from the Sex Pistols. I mean, I've seen every great drummer come through this hallway and I never asked them any questions, man. And I, if I could turn back the clock, I would just be the guy in the front row, the total nerd guy. You know, <laughs> what cologne do you wear? Because, you know, I was just so into drumming at the time. I just th I yeah. have a question. Yes, sir. Do you find it easier to perform to a track that you've never heard, or would you rather come into musicians you've never played with? That is a great question. Uh, I think musicians that I never played with only because they provide humanity, as opposed to me interacting with the machine, which I don't mind, but the humans add that extra element that take it even further than machines. And I'll always stand by the humans. I mean, let's, let's face it. When the electricity goes out, man, we have our sticks, we have logs, we have car bumpers, car windshields, we could pound on anything and we'll always be drummers. So that's really important. But yes, humans, for sure. Any other questions? Oh, getting back to that, yeah. Please don't hesitate to ask me any question. I don't care what it is. Because it's important because if you're serious about drumming, every little question will remain in your life that you ask me or Garrison or whoever, because you'll remember it and you'll not only apply it to your drumming, but you'll apply it to, you know, your life as well. When I was a student, just like you guys, I would go hang out at clubs. Back in the day, 20 years ago, it was the Baked Potato, um, the Palace, which is over here on Vine, there was a bunch of cool clubs to go hang out at, and it was all the best drummers playing in town. Vinny Caliuda, I'd see him play with a band called Dog Cheese with Mike Landau and a couple other cats. Uh, I'd go see Jeff play at the Baked Potato. Um, I would just go see anyone and everyone that was playing. If it was blues, if it was rock, if it was a punk gig, if it was funk, straight up funk in the hood, I'd go there and check it out because Every drummer w just would have a style that you could, you could cop from and learn some things from. So getting back to your question, I would go and hang out 
And sure enough, there would be a drummer, he'd be tired. Or he didn't feel like playing. He'd be like, man, you want to sit in? Sure, I'd sit in. I wouldn't be shy, man, because I knew that moving here to Los Angeles, this is the hub of where it all goes down. And if you guys remember that, when you guys are out at a club and someone asks you to sit in, sit in. Don't be shy. If you screw up and you, you suck, you drop the sticks, the snare drum stand is tilting, just keep playing. Because uh, that shows heart. And those guys will remember that. And they'll say, man, that cat was funky. He was rocking. He had solid time. I'm going to hire him for another gig that I can't do. And that's how it starts. The ball just rolls. A quick story. When I was a student here, uh, toward the end, before I landed my first pro gig with Morris Day in the time, Gary Hess had all these gigs that he was doing. And he would come in ragged. And he couldn't teach a class because he'd be making all this money. And you'd never see him. And you know, he was the drummer's drummer, and we all looked up to him, and he said, Kurt, I have this one gig. It pays 50 bucks. You have to go every Wednesday night and play show tunes. And I would go every Wednesday night for 50 bucks for three hours and play stupid show tunes, but it helped me not only uh, as a paying gig, 50 bucks a week, but it also was an uh, experience for me to learn how to play show tunes, which I never could play or ever into playing because I thought it was stupid. But now <laughs> that's part of my job today is to play show tunes, playing on movies and stuff, so I can't complain. But because of that gig, I was able to learn how to read charts better. And so when I'd go to my applied sight reading classes, my reading got better. And um, just so you guys know, I, was, I wasn't a reader when I came here. I couldn't even read a quarter note. And my whole purpose of coming to PIT was to learn how to read. So. I kind of knew all the styles, Latin, funk, rock, all that stuff, but I wanted to learn how to read because I wanted to be a studio guy, and I wanted to be a, a guy who played live on the road with some, some artists. So I knew if I didn't know how to read, I probably wouldn't get those gigs. And sure enough, you know, I'd talk to Gary, or I'd talk to Ralph, Joe Picaro, I'd talk to all the cats and say, man, you know, how do you get this gig? The first thing they'd always say, you got to learn how to read. And sure enough, they were right, you know, because as I was coming up in my career, I would get handed charts. I swear to God, man, I would want to just go in the bathroom. And <laughs> I quit because the charts are just, it looked like someone got black paint and just poured it all over the chart like this, and whoosh, you know. And I'm like, I can't read this, man. And I swear, every time I do a session with a chart like that, maybe, you know, it's, it's the God's way of taking care of me, but they'd always say, you know what? Don't read what's on the chart. Just play time, they would say. I'd be like, oh, man, cool. I could just play time. I don't have to read this. As long as I know where the repeat signs are, the DS, the coda, I'm totally cool. So anyway, long story short, reading is imp just you have to learn how to read. That's just the bottom line. Even if it's I always tell you know private students, when I taught privately for a little bit, I always just say, you know, five minutes, five minutes a day. I don't mean to be crude, but sometimes when you're sitting on the toilet and you need something to read, you read a, you know, the Buddy Rich book or, you know, Sticking Technique or <laughs> any book you choose, do that. Or, you know, when you're on a bus ride or you're at the beach, just five, five minutes, that's all. Eight bars. If you do that every day, you'll be able to get your reading way up. So anyway, to answer your question, sit in, hang out, Meet other drummers, the keyboard players, the singers, the contractors, all those guys. And eventually they will call you. I, I know this for a fact. They will. In 85, you know, that was the time of Simmons drums. You guys remember the Simmons drums? Those ugly octagon or hexagon things. So a lot of electronic music in the 80s was with the Simmons drums and the Lin drum and the Lin 9000 drum. So all that music that was coming out at that time had these machines. So I would practice to what was on the radio back then with these drum machines. And you know, we all know those drum machines, they don't move, they just stay right there. And that's how I developed my groove, is by playing with drum machines, programming drum machines, different beats, playing against it, with it, behind it, on top of it, in front of it. And that helped develop my groove immensely. And then being able to play with all the great bass players here in Los Angeles, you know, Abe Laborio Sr. and Reggie Hamilton and 
I mean, the list goes on. These guys are just world-class timekeepers. And if you can hang with those guys, you know, your groove's got to be up there. <laughs> so I would learn from them, and I'd always ask questions. I'd always say, you know, what, what's your technique to keep good time? And that's another thing, too. I mean, when you see drummers that you like and you're into their thing, go, go up and ask them what, what they do. Like your question, what was it that developed my groove? I would have to say drum machines, programming them and playing to them. That really, really helped me. This fill, by the way, is named after, and it's an old fill. I don't know who came up with it first, but it's an old fill, and it works. And I've played it on every record I've probably ever played on. But do you guys know who Pat Boone is? The Christian singer? Back in the day, he wasn't a Christian singer, I don't think. But he, uh, he would have a variety show, and he was really, you know, kind of white bread and, you know, perfect and you know it was back in the day where television was very straight laced and and that was Pat Boone he had a daughter named Debbie Boone who I've actually played with in Japan we uh, did an Amway gig together and she's wonderful anyway my favorite fill is called the Pat Boone Debbie Boone now check it out I'll just play simple time and you guys tell me where the name Pat Boone, Debbie Boone comes in. Okay, check it out. I love that fill. Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, man. It works every time. And you guys have records and CDs that have that fill, I swear. It, different tempos. Yeah. Pat Boone, Debbie Boone. It works every time. Slow tempos. I must have played that fill like 40 zillion times on the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers record, I swear. It just, it works, man. So anyway, that's my favorite film. My handy dandy computer playing claps and a tom thing. Two, four. One, two, three, four. So check it out. I'll play behind this so you feel what it's like playing behind. You hearing where the claps fall? They're like ahead of me. I was just playing behind. A little more funkier feel like that, you know? Maybe something like this. Okay, this would be on top, or the way I would play on top. That's a little too on top. Hold on. <laughs> now, to get that feeling of on top, I usually play eighth notes. If I want to get funky, I play quarter notes. So do you guys hear the feel, the difference between the funky kind of vibe and then the eighth notes, you know? The eighth notes kind of put it more on top. Very rarely will I play ahead of that because, A, I'm really not that good at playing ahead. <laughs> Being my age and listening to the music I grew up listening to, everything was always either with it or behind it. So, but I, again, it's you know programming a drum machine, or and 
playing along with that, and you'll find where you play where it feels really comfortable with the quarter notes, the two and four on the backbeat, the one and threes on the kick, and the eighth notes or the quarter notes. You'll find where it feels really comfortable. I'll, I'm going to be completely honest with you right now. I was really nervous about doing today because you know you guys are the are the next upcoming cats and gals coming up that are going to groove. You know that are going to be making records and making CDs and being in bands and going on tour. So I want to make a good impression. And I, I kept my wife up all night. What am I going to play for the guys and the, and the gals there at PIT? What am I going to do? You know. So in answer to your question, yeah, I was nervous about today. Just, you know, because this is my alma mater and I, you know, I want to do a good job. I want to, you know, represent what you guys will be doing, you know, hopefully soon after you guys graduate. When I show up at a session, bring it on. When that red light goes on, I'm, you know, the Terminator. <laughs> uh, and maybe that's just because I've, I've done it so much and I've, I've um, grown comfortable to that. But I'm most nervous when I'm just amongst a setting of intimacy like this with, you know, my homies, <laughs> my drummers. So it's... Uh, in answer to your question, yes, I'm nervous right now, but at 2 o'clock, I won't be nervous at capital A. Go figure. I don't know what that is. But to get over the nervousness, you know, you're there for a reason. When someone calls you and says, hey, can, um, what is your name? Yes. If the producer calls and goes, Aisha, we want you to show up at capital B today at 3 o'clock to replace Kurt Piscaro's drums because he was terrible. Uh, we want we want you to show up. Now, you would probably get really freaked out about that. I know I would. I still do when some calls me and says, "Hey, can you come and come down and play? You know, replace this drum machine or replace this snare drum that we programmed." Or you know, it's still that's weird because you know they already had a plan, a, a set sequence, a set way they wanted to do things. Um, but the reason why they're calling you, because they know that you can do the job. They know that Aisha's capable of doing the job. And that's one way to get over your nervousness, is if they call you, you know you're the right person for the job. And just go in there knowing that with that confidence, and, you, and you'll find that it'll get easier and easier. When you guys start doing recording sessions, or some sort of gig live where the house where your drums are set up and you're playing in is is a union place, you'll need to join Local 47, the Los Angeles uh, Musicians Union, and then you will be paid through the union. Uh, if you work for a record label, if you guys play on a Blink-182 record and replace Travis Barker, the record label will pay you through Local 47 as a uh, drummer. And that's how you get paid, and usually, uh, record companies are on top of it, especially these days because there are so many little record labels that there's two or three people and you develop a relationship with whoever's running the label and um, they're really prompt in paying and, and uh, if you have problems getting paid, contact your local rep at the union and they'll help you out. But that's, uh, if you join the union, you'll get a union handbook and it'll show you uh, the rates in which you'll get paid, double scale, single scale, uh, television scale. So depending on what kind of work you do, you'll, that's how you get paid. But um, a, a union rep will be able to answer that even more clearly than I. This is an example of what it's like when I go into the studio. Like today's session that I got to go to. Sometimes, and a lot of times, I'll show up, and the producer will say, we have a loop that we want you to play on top of. And <laughs> Eddie Rossetti. We're going to get to him in a moment. I have some stories. Um, a lot of the times when I show up at a studio, they'll have a pre-programmed loop uh, of something, and they'll come to me and say, Kurt, we want you to play just hi-hat and crash cymbals on this loop. And it would sound something like this.
you're thinking, that's boring. I'm thinking that right now. It's kind of boring. As a matter of fact, every time I get called to do that, it's boring. But to do that consecutively for three and a half, four minutes, that's where the challenge comes in. Um, and programming a drum machine and playing to it, that's what helped me be able to do overdubs, such as hi-hats and crash cymbals over a drum loop. Um, a lot of the times now, these days, with Pro Tools, I'll maybe play eight or ten bars of that, of what I just played. And because of technology, they'll be able to take two bars of that and paste it all the way across the song, take my crash cymbal, and put it anywhere in the song they want. As a drummer, that really sucks, because that means I'm only there for like a half hour. I don't get to play on the song. The cool part of it is that technology, you know, it'll take that and put it where the producer wants it, and then that leaves more time for me to go home and hang out, have a nice cold beer, hang out with my wife, pet my dogs. So it's a, it's a give and take thing, but I prefer to have played the whole kit. But because of music today, there's a lot of drum loops and stuff like that. So. Um, that's a lot of what I do is like overdubs with hi-hat. A lot of the times, too, uh, there will be a drum loop and I'll replace it. So the producer will say, okay, play along with the drum loop. And I'll go, okay, here we go. go, Kurt, that sucked. I don't want it to feel like that. I want double time. I want it to be on top. I want it to be more punk. So he'll roll it again. So he'll find four bars of that and then pace it along and do whatever he wants with it, put filtering and weird effects and stuff. So that's a lot of what studio drumming is today, unfortunately, but fortunately because I have more time to hang out. Uh, this same loop again, check it out. How many of you think those are real drums? Raise your hand. OK. How many of you think they're not real? <coughs> OK. Let me explain. This sound, or I should say this loop, is two things. It's a program called BFD, which used real drums to make real sounds I played that groove with my keyboard and put it on my computer. So there you have it. You have technology and humanity intermingling once again. So these guys, BFD, they got all these cool drums. They got DWs. They got the other drum companies. Garrison. All those other drums, you know. They got the cool drums, the DW drums. And they sampled them in different environments, different microphones, different studios, and they made. That's just one of hundreds of sounds that they have. So actually, what I did with this one, I programmed part of the drum loop with my keyboard, and then the other part with my drum cat. So I was able to put a little bit of humanity into it, along with some program stuff. And so that's how I was able to come up with that. So. You know, you guys are really smart to hear that and go, well, these aren't really real drums, which is true. It's a loop, it's a program, but they use real drums to make the sound. So that's, that's um, kind of what's going on today with drums and music, with that stuff. Um, check this out. A lot of the times, too, 
I'll get called to do some sort of session, and the producer will go, dude, I want you to play something really funky on top of this rock riff that I have, but it's only guitar. <laughs> and I'm like, how do I play to that? So again, going back to programming a drum machine and playing to that and learning how to lock with that, you start to find that your vocabulary of locking time with other stuff becomes easier, such as this. So the guy will say, play a funk beat over this. go, no, that's too old school. I want it to be more Questlove-like. And I go, okay, cool. And then he goes, and then I go. You get the idea, you want to put different flavors and stuff up against, is this really loud? It is, okay. So I'm like, God, that's loud, I'm going deaf. Um, Garrison, this snare stand is, <laughs> I think I broke it. Don't. Oh. Well, Garrison is fixing that. Uh, so again, a lot of this stuff is so, you know, technology driven, but it takes a human drummer to really make it feel good. I, I like for him to tell you guys the story about how he got the gig with Morris Day. <laughs> uh, anybody know the groove 7779311? This guy can put that in at the drop of a dime. Any groove that he plays, he could play that groove and go back to what he was doing. That's what used to freak me out. <laughs> Actually, yeah, let me tell a story about that. When I was a student here, I'd heard, and the rumor was going around the, the school, Morris Day is auditioning drummers. And this was right after Purple Rain, the success of that. Morris uh, departed Prince and went, went at it on his own. And he was putting a band together to go tour his solo record called Color of Success. And here's this Filipino kid from Santa Maria, California, 19 years old, totally into Prince, totally into the time, totally into that whole Minneapolis funk scene. And I heard about this, man. I was like, man, I got to get down there. So I go down there, and there's 50 drummers. I, I, I counted. There was 50. I was number 51. So me, little old country bumpkin me from Santa Maria, I walk into the hallways of SIR, and I go up to the mu musical director. Uh, musical director, is it okay if I audition? And, you know, they'd gone through maybe 47 drummers at that time. He's like, uh, all right, put your name on the list. So it was, my, it was my turn to audition. Guess what I forgot? My sticks. So the dude before me had these raggedy-ass sticks. As a matter of fact, he was a drummer that went to uh, Dick Grove School in the Valley. I don't know if that school's around. Do you know if that school's around? Fred? Anyway, so I was like, dude, let me borrow your sticks, man. I, you know, it's time for me to hit. He goes, all right. And they, these sticks were chewed up. I mean, just nasty. So I go in, and um, as a matter of fact, let me just play you a taste of the two songs that I auditioned on. I got it right here. Check it out. Handy iTunes. I played this song for Morris Day. These were the two songs that he was auditioning on. This one being called The Bird. You guys remember the song? 1985. I'm going to fast forward to the chorus. There we 
remember this? Here's the chorus. Anyway, you get the vibe. Straight up funk, Minneapolis. This was the other song that I auditioned on. It's called Jungle Love. Remember this? You'll remember this one. Yes! All right. <laughs> oh, e yo, e yo. You guys remember that. All right, so Dick, so those are the two songs that he was auditioning, right? Every drummer, there's 51 dudes, me being the 51st dude. So I auditioned on those tunes. He had his sunglasses on, and he, was, he wasn't really feeling me. So he said, what other songs do you know that I've written? And I said, well, I know this song. So I said, uh, okay, I know this song, 777-9311. Um, and he laughed, because <laughs> that song is a drum machine song. But because I was so into the Minneapolis thing, I listened and listened over and over and over again. And I think this is as close as I could get, or as close as I could get where it got me the gig for Morris. And it, it goes something like this. I play that for Morris Day, and he stood up from off the couch with his sunglasses, and he went, Kurt, you want a job? <laughs> and that's how I got the gig. And I was 19. I graduated three, re three weeks early for graduation so I could start rehearsal with Morris in August of 85. Um, one of the things that I'm really proud of is that I was a student of PIT. And I was one of many drummers, by the way, that have gone on to do some cool stuff. So you guys, I'm living proof that you could do it. And, and really what it takes is just perseverance. If you hear about those auditions or you hear about someone, the music that you're into, if Blink-182 is auditioning a new drummer or you know, Yellow Card or whoever, you know, P. Diddy, go. Go there, because you know what? There might be an opportunity for you to go play drums. He'll, he might go, you know what, man? I want a blonde-haired drummer. And there's be this, this blonde who just so happens to play drums, who's funky, and P. Diddy will go, you got the job, just like how Morris did with me. So you guys, that's, that's really, really um, essential. It's just, you know, don't be afraid. Don't be shy, man. Definitely Morris Day in the time because that was my first gig at the ripe young age of 19, right out of PIT. And so I'm really proud of that. Met, made my mom proud. <laughs> so that one definitely for sure. Um, playing with Mick Jagger was, you know, come on, he's the lead singer for the Stones, so you can't go wrong there. I'm really proud of that. He made a great record. Um, Bonnie Raitt which was my first actual uh, studio gig with uh, producer Don Was. That's one of my favorites. Um, just recently, I played with Natalie Cole on her new record that's coming out. And that was so cool, because she's such a great singer. And to play the songs behind her, you know, because she would cut live with the band. It was just it was awesome, man, because she sings so well. It was so, so much fun. So I would say, yeah, those, those gigs really stick out in my mind. <laughs> The most challenging gig was, uh, was and still is whenever I get called for a movie date. Movie dates have orchestras and a conductor. 
and the drummer, we are way in the back. The percussion session is way in the back. The conductor's way over there. That's intimidating. The charts start from here, and it takes four music stands, and it ends right about here. I have to spread them out with four stands because I'm not very good at playing and turning pages, so I have to get four music stands and line it all up. So those are the most intimidating when there's a lot of music to play. Uh, but again, when I show up at the studio, I'm raring to go, and I, I welcome the challenge. And there are some times where I fall flat on my butt, and I have to tell the producer, look, can I do an overdub? Because I sucked, and I couldn't play. And, <laughs> and he'll say, yeah, sure. And so I, I could make up for it after the orchestra leaves, or if it's OK and they could live with it, they might take a nice part of the fill that I did, the Pat Boone, Debbie Boone fill, and replace it with the one I flubbed up on, you know, because we have Pro Tools now. So yeah, that's, those are pretty much the most intimidating, because there's like 50 people in a room, and you're driving the bus. So those could be scary, definitely. I'll play that for you. A lot of engineers and producers don't like it when I play this. And it's just a bad habit, because I have bad technique. I, I admit it, I have bad technique, <laughs> as you guys are witnessing. But check it out. This is what I always get busted on. Listen to the snare drum. It's a bad habit. Hear those little skips? Those little ghost notes? A lot of the time, engineers and producers don't want that. But to me, I think it's adding feel and a signature sound. But a lot of times they go, don't play that. It's driving me nuts. So I have to sit there and concentrate. You know. It, sometimes I have to do that because I'll be so freaked out. Like, man, OK, I can't play that ghost note. I can't play that ghost note. So I'll just go like this. You know. Then he'll go, I'm, I'm missing the <laughs> eighth note on the hi-hat. And I'm like, oh, God. So then I have to do this. Oh, see? So there's all these little things you have to think about when there's microphones around you. And yeah, that's one of the things I do a lot that engineers don't like. Bad habit. Because, again, technology plays a role. And they may want to just use two bars of what I played and paste it all the way across the song. For instance, I just did a session for Pink's new record. Mike Elizondo was the uh, producer. You might know of Mike. He's a bass player. He works you know, hand in hand with Dr. Dre. Mike lives right around the corner from me where we live. And he, he calls me for sessions. And this one was for Pink. And uh, he calls me and he goes, dude, I need you to lay a solid rock beat. You know, here's the tempo. So I play along. He's like, no, 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 dude, dude. The snare drum. I'm like, what's wrong with the snare drum? He goes, what are those notes in there? What's that sound? And I go, what? Because I hear all these extra notes. And again, I had to think about, oh, shit, I'm, shoot, I'm playing, <laughs> I'm playing those ghost notes again. So on Pink's record, I had to, I had to think about that again. And <laughs> so imagine four minutes of only concentrating on your left hand so you don't play ghost notes. So that's, you know, an example. So you remember the track, remember it goes, show me the way you go to the yeah. That's my seal impression. Anyway, so that was cut live at a studio in Culver City. And it was me, Randy Jacobs on guitar, who is the singer and lead singer and guitarist for the, the Bone Shakers, Was Not Was. Neil Stubinas, a fabulous LA session player, bass player, and Jamie Mohobrak keyboard player. 
and it was just the four of us tracking that song with Seal singing in the booth. And that feel goes a little something like this. Right, so no, I'll just play a groove. Billy Jean? Okay, Billy Jean. Another great drummer in Dooku Chancellor. So I'll play Billy Jean by Michael Jackson. Check it out. Wait a minute. There's no fills in Billy Jean. Okay, so I'll make fills for Billy Jean. Okay, I've already played Pat Boone, Debbie Boone, so I'll try not to do that. Black em, black em, black em, black em, black em. That, that one I could totally overplay, but I, I saved that for the special, special moment. All right, so I'm going to get to this guitar riff. So I think the last I left you was with uh, a funky groove over the guitar riff. This time, the producer would say, okay, play something halftime up against it. So I would do something like this. <laughs> So dig this. He'll say, I didn't like that. Play something halftime up against this drum loop that I got. So I go, OK, let's try it. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say goodbye now. Thank you so much, you guys.